Good evening, everyone. I under, oh, apparently, I was just gonna say, is that working? But I can actually hear that it's working. I was told I didn't have to pick it up, that this would work, so thank you, IST. Um, I'm Allison Abra, I'm the warden of St. John's College, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to the relaunch of the Wilmot Lecture Series, um, endowed sometime before COVID and paused for COVID, um, but now renewed. And so we're really happy to see you here tonight and to have this fantastic panel that we're going to be hearing from uh, this evening. Um, and before I introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Turnbull to introduce our panel, I did just want to say that, um, you know, there's a lot of great things happening at the college as we sort of ease back into the new normal world. Um, we're going to be sending around uh, sign-in sheets tonight. If you don't get emails from the college letting you know about upcoming events or, you know, just newsletter info and all of that, and you would like to, please be sure to sign um, the form as it circulates in your direction and we would love to keep in touch with you after this evening. Um, so many of you will know, oh, actually, sorry, I was about to move on, but I did want to draw your attention to the fact that there's a couple of things um, upcoming uh, that could be of interest to some of you. Our other big annual event of the year is the Marjorie Ward Lecture, endowed in the name of the former registrar of the college and our Dean of Studies, Jade Weimer, is here. She has planned a fantastic lecture on March 11th at 5.30 back here in this room um, that is going to be Dr. Marcia Anderson talking about Indigenous health issues, pandemic-centered, and the like, so that's going to be great. And then on March 22nd, we're going to have the wrap up of our music and art competition where there will be a concert in the chapel of a number of um, student musicians from the Faculty of Music here at U of M and then a reception because we always feed you at St. John's in the Daily Bread Cafe to wrap up the art portion of the annual competition where all of the art will be um, hung and displayed in the college as of next Friday. This Friday, we're hanging it, right? So I hope that you'll be able to join us for the, some of those things. But like I said, there's a lot going on. We had a fantastic theology talk, uh, Food for the Journey, on Saturday morning. Yesterday, the return of the Sistema fundraising uh, concert in the chapel, which was fantastic. So I hope that you'll keep in touch with us and come out to a number of these events in the future. Um, and now I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Ryan Turnbull, recently Dr. Ryan Turnbull. Congratulations to him. Um, he, as many of you will know, was recently hired as the diocesan discipleship developer in the Diocese of Rupert's Land. And he's working out of the college, doing fantastic work, figuring out the future of theological education and lay ministry here in Rupert's Land. And one of the things that he's been uh, really working on is thinking about outreach and programming that can be of use to um, uh, everyone uh, across our parishes and just, you know, to Christians across Winnipeg and across the province. So um, he's been working on that really hard. And one of the things that he's been doing is to bring back the Wilmot Lecture Series. And so I will now turn the floor over to Ryan um, to introduce our uh, distinguished panel. And I'm looking forward to the event. Thanks again for coming. And don't forget, because we always feed you at St. John's College, there will be a reception following this, uh, the panel tonight. Thank you. I'm just going to send these around. So. Oh. Uh, thank, thank you all so much for coming. We really had no, no way of knowing what to expect for this evening because it's been so long since we've done one of these. And uh, coming out of the pandemic, it's just lovely to see faces again in this room to um, think carefully about our faith. So I... Um, when we were trying to figure out how to get this thing going again, Allison had the great idea <clears throat> that we should bring in uh, some of the local talent that we have. And I was thinking, OK, who is in Winnipeg who's doing interesting things? And who could we do a panel with? And then I immediately thought of my good friends here who are all working in some way on book projects related to the theme of witness. And so I threw together this abstract, which you may have read, but I will just read it again to kind of um, <laughs> loosely guide our reflections this evening. I've entitled this, this talk, Witness in a Post-Secular Age, um, because over two decades ago, the sociologist Peter Berger remarked that society, far from being completely secularized, was as furiously religious as ever. While Christianity may no longer have a monopoly on religious discourse in Canada, discourses of theology, religion, and the sacred continue to shape our lives in all sorts of ways. 
The task of the theologian is to find words to go on speaking about the God revealed to us in scripture, even as the old words change or lose their meaning. Theology then has as one of its tasks, the work of bearing witness. This is a work that cannot stop because while God may be unchanging, the world is not. For this year's Wilmot Lecture, we present a panel of theologians from right here in Winnipeg, who are each in their own unique way, reflecting on what it is what it means to bear witness in the world as it is now. <laughs> Covering diverse perspectives from across various contemporary critical and constructive fields in theology, uh, Drs. Jane Barter, Chris Hubner, and Daniel Rempel offer us snapshots of what it means to witness in Canada today. So <clears throat> we're going to begin in uh, the order that you see them sat here this evening. So I will introduce them all, and then uh, how the evening will unfold is They've each prepared about a 15 minute presentation lifted from the book projects that they're working on. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of conversation as a panel. Uh, we've all had the pleasure of being able to look at each other's work uh, over the weekend. So we'll have a little bit of discussion and then we're gonna turn it over to you folks. Um, we have microphones set up in the aisles. So please come to the microphone to ask your question. And that's really important because this whole event's being recorded. So in order for everybody to, to be able to hear that, um, if you want, write your question down ahead of time so that we have a good question and we can get lots of questions in. Uh, and then we will head outside to continue our discussion over some wine. Dr. Daniel Rempel is Assistant Professor of Biblical and Theological Studies at Providence University College. He recently completed his PhD at the University of Aberdeen, where his dissertation explored Karl Barth's theology of witness as a way for thinking about the Christian witness of people with intellectual disabilities. Dr. Chris Hubner is Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Canadian Mennonite University, where he has taught for the past 23 years. His scholarly work explores the intersection of epistemology and ethics and pays special attention to the way these are woven together in the figure of the martyr. He's the author of two books, A Precarious Peace in 2006 and Suffering the Truth in 2019. He is currently working on two more book length manuscripts. The first of these projects studies the relationship between martyrdom, knowledge, and the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity as they are expressed in the dramatic works of the medieval playwright Hrostsvit of Gandersheim. Is that close? Yeah? and three plays of Shakespeare, King Lear, Othello, and The Winter's Tale. The second project focuses on the early modern Dutch Mennonite experience and examines the intertwining of three distinct threads that emerge out of that tradition. The conservative-leaning Mennonite impulses reflected in the martyr's mirror, the more liberal-leaning circle that was centered around the so-called radical publisher, Jan Rieverts, who was known for his secret publication of the works of the abominable heretic Benedict Spinoza, and the martyr dramas written by the well-known Dutch Mennonite playwrights, Joost van den Vondel and Joachim Udan. Udan. The Reverend Dr. Jane Barter is a professor of religion and culture at the University of Winnipeg and holds a PhD from the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. Her research interests include political theology, theopolitics, memory, and violence. She has published two monographs of Christian theology, Lord, Giver of Life, from Wilfrid Laurier University Press, and Thinking Christ, Christology and Contemporary Critics, from Fortress Press. She recently co-edited with Doris Kieser, St. Joseph's College, University of Alberta, a special volume of the Journal of Moral Theology on the Papal Visit and Apology to Survivors of Residential Schools in Canada, and gave an excellent talk about this at St. Paul's last week. Um, and she is the editor of the Christology volume of the TNT Clark Encyclopedia of Christian Theology. Her current project is a book with Rutledge, right? Uh, on witnessing to contemporary atrocities and their theological antecedents. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Turnbull. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, especially alongside theologians who have all shaped my own theological journey in their various ways. Um, what I find so fascinating about the topic of witness is that as we will see today, witness is something which intersects with the Christian life in many different ways. Each member of this panel is going to offer uh, a contribution to witness from a different angle. 
My own perspective comes out of my research at the intersection of intellectual disability and the Christian life, the topic of my doctoral dissertation, as Ryan noted, which I am currently revising for publication. And what I will present here, I want to offer two aspects of my research. First, what do I mean by the term witness? And second, how does bringing people with intellectual disabilities into the conversation affect how we approach the category of witness? Now, I'm not unique in this panel in being influenced by the work of the 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth. If you may not know, uh, but Barth is, is not only one of the most prominent theologians of the 20th century, he was also influential as a pastor in fighting for the rights of workers in the village of Zoffenville before aiding the, confess the confessing church in their resistance to Nazism in the lead up to the Second World War. For our purposes, though, it may be most pertinent to note that Bart was a theologian who was captivated by the idea of witness all throughout his life. From his early commentary on the Book of Romans through nearly every volume of his opus, The Church Dogmatics, Bart suggested that the proper posture of all things Christian is to witness to the God who has invaded history in the person of Jesus Christ. Indeed, the very words of scripture are to be read as witness to the action of God, pointing us ultimately towards the life of the true witness, Jesus Christ, the one who shows us God. However, near the end of Bart's life, he finally began to exposit concretely what it might mean for the Christian to live as witness. And in doing this, he comes to the basic foundational conclusion. The task that all Christians are called to is to live their lives as God's witnesses. For Bart, Christians are, quote, witnesses of the God who was who he was, is who he is, and will be who he will be in these acts of his. They are witnesses of the God who in these acts of his, and therefore as God, was, is, and will be with his creation, the world, and all humanity, end quote. To be a witness is, for Bart, to be one who attests to the works of God. Yet to be a witness is not something which primarily occurs as a result of our own volition or efforts, but comes about as we are called by God. One's calling is the impetus for their witness. To be called means both that God reveals God's self in God's action, and also that God summons ones into the witness box, um, as those who know. In other words, to be a witness is to be someone who has been encountered by God, and can attest to that encounter where God calls them to God's self. Witness is thus the goal of Christian existence. But our action in witnessing is not the first required step. Witness is the goal, but it is only possible because of the creative call of the living Jesus Christ, which brings one into the new place of the Christian. To be clear, three things are important for Bart here. For witness to occur first, God must act. Second, humanity must be encountered. And third, humanity must respond. To be a witness, one must experience that which they are witnessing to. Without this encounter via the prior act of God, no witness is possible. Unfortunately, we don't have time to delve into either of these first two points here. However, it is important to acknowledge them as the basis of Christian witness because doing so necessitates the recognition that our witness is never primarily our own task. Witness begins with God. And truthful witness is rooted in the correspondence of our acts toward the God who has encountered us. To state the emphasis of this concept slightly differently, Christian witness occurs as God empowers us to do so, as we respond to the God who is at work in the world. In my work, I situate Bart's theology of witness as the way to speak of the witness of people with intellectual disabilities. I deploy Bart not because he speaks all that much on the topic of disability, but because of what Christiana Tietz has called Bart's lasting disruptive potential. One of Bart's lasting contributions is the way he emphasized the absolute otherness of God over against the world. God alone is the one who can shake the world out of the sinful status quo, disrupting our fallen actions, attitudes, and ideologies. On the one hand, we can find an ally in Bart's theology, which allows us to think and understand God as being over against a world which continues to oppress disabled bodies, 
perceiving them as being less worthy than so-called able-bodied people. Bart's emphasis on the power of Christ as being the source of our witness is that which empowers witnesses to act in this oppressive world today, regardless of perceived ability. And it is also that which allows us to receive the truth inherent to the witness's message. However, I want to take this reading of Bart one step further. In my work, I don't situate the disruptive potential of Bart's theology as the mere means of liberating an oppressed minority or the ones in need of disruption. This is not a savior complex in which the able-bodied person comes in witnessing to or even on behalf of the disabled individual as the means of their liberation. Rather, I read people with intellectual disabilities into Bart's account as the witnesses themselves. In doing so, people with intellectual disabilities become the means of disruption as they are empowered by God to do so. In witnessing to the God who has encountered them, who has dispensed knowledge of God's self to them, people with intellectual disabilities may carry this disruptive yet liberative message of God into a world desperately in need of reconciliation and redemption. In this reading, people with intellectual disabilities are not mere recipients but the agents of witness themselves. Now my proposal immediately runs at odds with two related common tropes about people with intellectual disabilities. First, that they cannot possess a required amount of knowledge. And second, that because of this lack of knowledge, they cannot act as agents, or at least their agency is compromised. Bart can help us through these tropes and see that it they are indeed not a barrier to witness in the way that he understands witness. First, I contend that Bart's understanding of how one comes to knowledge of God opens up the possibility for people with intellectual disabilities to know God. For Bart, knowledge of God comes as we participate in the life of God. Knowledge in this sense is acquired via relationship and always remains veiled. Just as we come to know our peers as we engage in relationship, so too is it with God. However, this relational knowledge is always incomplete. Paradigmatic of this is for Bart Exodus 33, the story of Moses being hidden in a rock while God passes behind Moses' back. God really speaks and Moses really hears, but Moses does not see God's face. God really encounters Moses but in a manner which accommodates Moses's ability to encounter God. Knowledge of God is not characterized by natural abilities, but by God's encounter. This leads us into the presupposition about the lack of agency inherent in people with disabilities. If witness is rooted in our response to God, then one's openness to encounter is all that is required in order to act. What constitutes a witness is not any particular act of our own doing beyond the work of God in our lives. Turning to the prophets, Bart suggests that what sets them apart as witnesses is not anything in particular that they did, but rather their openness to the calling of God on their lives, which in turn resulted in specific sign acts being revealed through their particular being. I want to argue that people with intellectual disabilities witness in a similar manner to the prophets of the Bible. What distinguishes witness in this sense is not one's innate ability to accomplish a task, but one's receptivity to an encounter with Jesus Christ. And like the prophets, what distinguishes the witness of people with intellectual disabilities has nothing to do with their disabledness, but rather is simply the way that God is at work in their lives. Just like God called the prophets to specific tasks, Isaiah was called to walk naked and barefoot for three years. Jeremiah was called to buy and bury a loincloth. Ezekiel was called to lie for 390 days on his left side before turning over and lying for another 40 days on his right side. So too, God calls people with intellectual disabilities to witness in particular ways. Thus, it is wrong to presume a generic categorical witness to people with intellectual disabilities. People with intellectual disabilities are not all peaceful, kind, gentle, etc. any more than all men love sports or all Winnipeggers love winter. Well, there may be some segments of the population whom we can accurately categorize in this way. It is widely accepted as false to assume all people who fall within any given category align 
with any given stereotype. And this doesn't even begin to touch on the perils of utilizing a word like disability to categorize people in the first place. Thus, to consider the witness of people with intellectual disabilities, we actually have to get to know people with intellectual disabilities. We have to live alongside them and open ourselves to encounter by them. And in so doing, while we may not be able to speak about a generic witness, we may come to see occasions of witness, moments in which God's disruptive potential is working through them. So allow me to conclude with one such story. This is a story of my friend, Adam. Adam lives in Aberdeen, a city on the east coast of Scotland. A few years ago, when he was about 14 or 15 years old, Adam found himself on a crowded sidewalk in downtown Aberdeen. And an obviously inebriated man was confronting people on a busy sidewalk. Every time a person passed by, this man was heard shouting, come on, want to fight? Adam was not spared the challenge as he passed by, and this aggressive encounter was heard by everyone within earshot. Without hesitation, Adam reached up, placed his hand flat across the mouth of the angry man towering over him. In this moment, this hurting man's aggressive mask immediately crumbled at a personal touch suffused with kindness. Such acts from Adam are not out of the ordinary, but it may help for me to color in just a little bit more of the story. My friend Adam has Down syndrome and autism. Because of this, he is shorter than the average man, and he doesn't communicate by using words. He's had a number of stays in the hospital to deal with heart issues and cancer, and his parents aren't sure how well he can see. Yet there's something startling about Adam and his encounter with this obviously inebriated man on a crowded sidewalk in Aberdeen, which embodies something that Adam's dad calls assaults of grace that commonly are imbued by encounters with Adam and Adam's witness. Reflecting on these events in Adam's life, Adam's dad has argued that, quote, something is being shown here that can be ignored and explained away, or it can be received with wonder. Those who dare to respond to this wonder gain a knowledge how that leads into a wholly different life, end quote. Just like the inebriated man on the street, Adam's witness is one which confronts those around him. While his witness may occur in gentle peacemaking gestures like putting a hand suffused with kindness on the mouth of a drunken and hurting man, that which confronts us has the ability to call us out of our preconceived understandings of the rituals of life and set us on a course to a wholly different life if we choose to respond to this wonder. To encounter witness is thus to be led to wonder. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to begin by um, echoing the thanks to Allison and to Ryan and to St. John's College I, in particular. Um, about a million years ago, I uh, did two philosophy degrees at this university, and uh, the college was the place then, I don't know if it is now, where the philosophy nerds uh, used to hang out uh, at the Daily Bread and procrastinate essay writing by having conversation as uh, university students do. And so it's good to be back uh, in these walls. This room didn't exist then. Um, maybe second uh, note uh, before I jump in, I, I don't know if I missed or simply ignored um, all the what about witness now in this age, in this time stuff. And so this is gonna be a little bit more historical um, than than that, I hope, uh, I hope nevertheless, it gives us something to talk about later. Okay, you did the first one. I'd be taking up the thread of the concept of witness that connects it to the category of martyrdom. Martyr and witness, we could say, are just 
Greek and English versions of the same word. And in doing so, I'll be reflecting on the sense in which martyrdom Give us a second. Uh, sense in which martyrdom is not an event, but a discourse. And I've got some quotes that you can ponder um, to save me from having to explain that. This means that the story of a martyr does not simply provide a straightforward empirical recounting of a particular death but rather it is in some respects a fabrication that involves an elaborately stylized and highly refined narration of a death. In this respect, a martyr story is as much a work of literature as of history. And so my goal this evening is to shed some light on how to read this literature. I'll proceed by looking at three specific martyr stories from quite different contexts and demonstrating how they share some overlapping themes, which are in turn developed in a range of different ways. To begin, let me introduce you to some of my ancestors. My 14th great grandfather was a man named Christopher Ridley, and no, I'm not named after him. He was born in 1475, just west of Newcastle. Whoops. Can we go back one? Uh, in England. It is said that he was a close associate of the infamous King Henry VIII, and indeed that he was one of the very few people whom Henry regarded as a friend. Dubious honor, uh, to be sure. <laughs> Among Christopher's children were two sons named Hugh and Nicholas. Hugh, in turn, had a son named Baldwin, who relocated from England to the Dutch province of Zeeland, where he served as a minister and was eventually appointed as a bishop in the growing community of English Protestants that were settling in that region. It was Baldwin's daughter, Apollonia, who got mixed up with Mennonites when she married a man named Daniel Tyson, whose family had fled north from Ghent to escape the fierce persecutions that were raging in Flanders at that time. But it was Baldwin's uncle and Hugh's brother, Nicholas, who went on to become the most well-known member of the family. Nicholas Ridley became a chaplain in the Church of England during the tumultuous years when it was separating from the Roman Catholic Church. He was a close associate of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, and they worked together on the Book of Common Prayer. He was eventually appointed as the Bishop of London, but when Mary I became queen and sought to return England to the Catholic Church, Ridley and other Anglican leaders were rounded up and charged with heresy. Ridley was sentenced to death by being burned at the stake. His execution, alongside that of his close friend Hugh Latimer, took place on the 16th of October in front of Balliol College in Oxford. Now when the pyre was lit and the flames began to hiss and pop near Ridley's feet, Latimer offered him encouragement by saying, quote, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. Even though he is said to have desired for Christ's sake to let the fire come unto him, John Fox emphasizes in his Acts and Monuments that Ridley was slow to burn. It seems the executioners had violated one of the basic rules of fire building that anyone who's been a Boy Scout knows. <laughs> they piled too many logs at the base of the stake. So the fire didn't go. Noticing this, Ridley's brother-in-law, George Shipside, attempted to fuel the fire by throwing more sticks onto the pile of logs. This, and I quote again from Fox, made the fire more vehement beneath so that it burned clean all his nether parts before it once touched the upper. And that, made, and that made him leap up and down in an attempt to help the flames reach higher up. Ridley cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. Let the fire come unto me before lamenting, I cannot burn. 
Eventually, another bystander intervened and helped the flames reach high enough to ignite the bag of gunpowder that was tied to Ridley's neck. With this, he slumped down low enough that he was finally consumed by the flames. Oh, I think I forgot to advance the image. You can look at that for a while. <laughs> It's uh, Ridley Latimer, Cranmer's up there in the tower. This is before he tried to get off the hook by recanting, which failed and he got burned a few weeks, months later. Uh, all the while, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Now readers familiar with the Christian martyrological tradition will recognize that these two points I've emphasized, the encouragement to play the man and the seeming uh, inability or slowness to burn are allusions to the story of the early Christian martyr, Polycarp. Polycarp was put to death in the year 155 for his refusal, among other things, to, but most importantly, to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods. When he was being led into the amphitheater to be burned at the stake, the Christians in the crowd are said to have heard a voice from heaven calling out, be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Later, when he was bound to the stake and the fire was raging, the account known as the martyrdom of Polycarp reports that the flames, quote, formed in the shape of a vault and thus surrounded the martyr's body as with a wall. And he was within it, not as burning flesh, but rather as bread being baked, or like gold or silver being purified in a smelting furnace. And from it, we perceive such a delightful fragrance as though it were smoking incense or some other costly perfume." End of quote. Polycarp was not just slow to burn. The fire apparently had no effect on him whatsoever. Quoting again from the martyrdom of Polycarp, at last when these vicious men realized that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they ordered a confector to go up and plunge a dagger into the body. When he did this, there came out such a quantity of blood that the flames were extinguished. And even the crowd marveled that there should be such a difference between the unbelievers and the elect. These sorts of allegorical and symbolic references are strewn throughout traditional martyr stories. They're especially common in portrayals of the martyr's death. In early Christian and medieval martyr stories, Roman emperors tried to kill Christian martyrs by burning or drowning them, but these efforts almost always failed in spectacular fashion. Read the golden legend. Instead, Christian martyrs typically died by the sword or by crucifixion. Now this was all a way of emphasizing that these were the deaths of exemplary Christians. Take the example of water. The Bible is full of stories and references that equate holiness with an apparent capacity to be unharmed by water. Think about Noah's Ark, the Red Sea, Jonah, Jesus walking on water, and Peter sinking when his faith uh, weakened. And all of these images are taken up into the central Christian rite, baptism. There's a similar range of biblical images about fire. The voice of God speaking from the unburnt bush, the three holy ewes in the book of Daniel, the fire of Pentecost, and the numerous references to purifying fire, echo of which we saw in the Polycarp story. And of course, fire was also generally a symbol of forgetting. It's just as important to note how they did eventually die the sword and crucifixion. John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul are both put to death by the sword, and the crucifixion of Jesus is, of course, the model for all Christian reflection on death. So stated simply, and far too simply, fire and water are problematic forms of death from a biblical perspective. And it's for this same reason that burning and drowning came to be the established punishments for the crime of heresy. And both of these sensibilities are reflected in the story of Ridley. On the one hand, he is sentenced to be burned at the stake because he was accused of heresy, charged, convicted. 
On the other hand, he is depicted as burning slowly because Fox is trying to demonstrate that he is not in fact a heretic, but an exemplary Christian like Polycarp. Because there's so much literal burning in early modern martyr stories, and so few spectacular miracles like that of Polycarp, it sometimes seems as if there's a new form of martyrological discourse emerging here. I keep forgetting my slides. Polycarp for a minute. And there's a sense in which this is true. There's a new, uh, a new discursive style emerging here, but I think it's only partly true. On the one hand, these stories sometimes seem to shift away from a more straightforwardly allegorical style and suggest the emergence of a new, more factual and empirical one where the deaths by burning are taken at face value and reported as such. But Fox's emphasis on Ridley's being a bad burner demonstrates that there are traces of the early Christian allegorical sensibility that remain. Even so, they are given a new twist in that they tend to be expressed in ways that are less explicitly miraculous, maybe reductively, and more naturalistic. Where Polycarp's not burning implies the direct miraculous intervention of God, Ridley's failure to burn is attributed to the fact that the logs were poorly distributed. This new twist, I think, adds something interesting and important, a level of nuance that helpfully captures the two-sided character of biblical fire imagery. Ridley is shown to, to desire one kind of fire, call it the good Christological fire of purification or holiness. This is the fire of God that does not consume or destroy, like that of the unburnt bush. But this is juxtaposed with the way, we, with what we may rather crudely describe as a bad kind of fire, good fire, bad fire, the fire associated with hell and forgetting. Fox's account emphasizes Ridley's desire for the good kind of fire while trying to demonstrate that the bad kind of fire fails to have any effect on him. And through this play of images and through some of the words that are inserted into the mouths of martyrs, it is important to notice that the stories of martyrs are knit together to one another and to the Bible by a series of allusions and echoes. They work by mapping a specific story onto other stories and ultimately onto a universal story. In this respect, we might say that martyrologies are a kind of resonance machine. Now, with all this in the background, let me turn to one of the most well-known martyr stories in my own tradition, the Mennonite tradition, the story of Dirk Willems. For those of you who may not be familiar with the story, the rough outline is as follows. Dirk was arrested and imprisoned in 1569 for hosting meetings, conventicles in his home that drew together a group of people, scary people, referred to as Anabaptists. He managed to escape and attempted to flee by running across the ice that had formed overnight on a nearby pond. And though he safely made it across to the other side, a thief catcher who was chasing him was not so lucky and broke through the ice. Noticing what happened, Dirk turned around and went back to rescue the man who had been pursuing him. The thief catcher, upon being saved, pled with the authorities that Dirk's life should be spared, but he was nevertheless recaptured and sentenced to die by burning. Now the story of Dirk Willems is beloved by contemporary Mennonites for its example of Christ-like love, but that misses a lot. Um, it also includes allegorical and elusive tropes that tend to go unrecognized, at least by contemporary Mennonites. Like Nicholas Ridley, the story of Dirk Willems also emphasizes that he was slow to burn. And again, like Ridley, this is also given a kind of naturalistic explanation. Quoting from the Martyr's Mirror, a strong wind was blowing that day, so the kindled fire was much driven away from the upper part of his body as he stood at the stake, in consequence of which this good man suffered a lingering death. 
In the end, the writer of this story notes that it is not clear what the executioner ultimately did to kill Dirk, and simply notes uh, that he was consumed by the fire kind of ambiguously leaving open the question of whether that's what killed him. The traditional symbolism of water is given an even more central place in this story. Like Jesus, Dirk walks on the water. Conversely, the thief catcher plunges through the ice and nearly drowns before Dirk rescued him, just like Peter and the other biblical figures who are said to have lacked faith. And I wonder if there might also be a joke here that gets missed by the overly earnest reading habits of contemporary Mennonites, where the punchline is that Dirk performs a baptism on the papist thief catcher who is pursuing him for performing illegal (laughs) rebaptisms. When we've lost the ability to appreciate these traditional allegorical and elusive references, it should not be surprising that we fail to register new ones new symbolic images. But there's an important one that is introduced in the etching uh, made by the Mennonite artist Jan Lauke. Notice that Dirk is wearing a hat. Well, the thief catcher has had his hat fall off. I'm not aware of a single discussion of the Dirk Willem story, and there's a lot of ink spilled over this story that mentions this. But I think this is a clue to what is perhaps the most significant element of the story in its context. The historian Simon Shama, in his great book, The Embarrassment of Riches, notes that in and around the year 1570, the motif of hat wearing became an important symbol in Dutch political iconography as an expression of personal liberty. This had its roots in the Roman tradition of the liberty hat where a freed slave was given a hat. Oh, that's the pawn today. It's actually kind of underwhelming. You'd maybe sink up to your waist. Um, Sorry, the liberty hat. Uh, Roman tradition of the liberty hat where a freed slave was given a hat to commemorate his release from captivity. And there it is on a coin. This iconography of the hat can also be identified. There it is um, in a kind of an allegory of this new uh, republic that's being formed. And here, finally, Brian, um, in, in a painting by a Mennonite artist about a Mennonite preacher, just to show that Mennonites got into the hat game. Hat program that runs through the tradition of 17th century Dutch portrait painting where, as one contemporary Dutch art historian puts it, the hat was an omnipresent symbol of Dutch liberty. Against the background of this nest of cultural references, it seems to me that Lauken's description of Dirk's ability to hold on to his hat and the thief catcher's loss of his own uh, gives expression, is an attempt to give expression to the freedom of the martyr and the captivity of those who are deficient in the faith. And I don't have time to develop an account of what this freedom looks like, but let me simply say or suggest that it's the freedom of one whose life is not structured too narrowly around strategic calculations about the potential consequences of our actions, but rather it it presents us with images of daring attempts to live as if the story of Jesus is actually true. And this in such a way that it turns some of our standard assumptions of freedom on their head by suggesting that the martyr is the ultimate example of human freedom. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to be here tonight. Um, thank you so much, Ryan, for organizing this and for thinking to invite me. Uh, thank you to the fellow pal- panelists. It's a great and august group to be among. And it's lovely to see so many fil- familiar faces in the crowd, former students, colleagues, fellow parishioners, bishops even. Um, yeah, it's great to see you all. So thank you for coming tonight. and. Um, I hope we're gonna have a fun conversation at the end of this. Mine's going to sound very different from the last two papers I think that you've heard. Maybe a little bit more irreverent, although we'll see, (laughs) we'll see. 
Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Okay, so the, the talk I'm going to give today is part of a book that I'm currently writing, which is titled Theopolitics and the Era of the Witness. And this book is an unusual one for theology. It is not faith-seeking understanding, as theology is often described. It is instead close to what, whoops, there he is, Friedrich Nietzsche. See, I told you it was going to be a little bit off this talk. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche described as a search for relatives, a genealogy. So common theme with that of Chris. Those of you who have engaged in theological research may have had the experience of the shock of recognition when you see a picture of an ancestor who looks a lot like their descendant. I don't know if anybody's had that kind of experience. And so if we think about the work of genealogy in this way, my project will make more sense. The search for relatives, of course, can be a very hazardous thing to do. So for example, this summer, my radical Republican son was having a great time looking at all of his ancestors on both sides, and uh, until he found um, one of his great-great-grandfathers on my side who had in eagerly enlisted in the Nova Scotian militia to fight the Fenian raids. So he was, he was totally disgusted after that, and he never <laughs> touched genealogy after that. So I don't know if I should say that at St. John's College, yay, Fe <laughs> yay Fenians, but anyway. So the genealogy that I traced in my book is also an ambivalent one. Um, there we go. Um, as Holocaust historian Annette Wiviorka argued, uh, the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem ushered in what she calls the new era of the witness. So there's the Eichmann trial, and here's Annette Wiviorka. No longer relying on documentary evidence primarily after the Eichmann trial, the witness took center stage in cases of mass violence. First-hand testimony was no longer to be detached and objective, but it consisted in the expression of anguish of those who had survived an ordeal. Their authority rested on the fact that they had witnessed the ineffable, an unprecedented and unimaginable form of violence. Like religious figures, they struggle to tell the story to an unbelieving world, like the first Shoah survivors, a story that they themselves perhaps had not fully appropriated. The cumulative effect of survivor testimony was viewed as a kind of liberation to them and to those who received their stories. The truth will set you free according to the Gospel of John chapter eight. For the witness, survivor could offer, offer inspiration to the Jewish people gathered to, the, to witness to the trial of Eichmann in the new founded House of Jerusalem in the new state of Israel. The witness survivors could impart knowledge to society in general, never again. Thus testimony became a source for personal and political redemption. The resemblances of the secular version of testimony to atrocity and theological accounts of witnessing are uncanny, and these are what I trace in my book. They are uncanny because they answer the kinds of questions that Jewish and Christian theology traditionally sought to answer. Why do the innocent suffer? What is the nature of redemption from suffering? How do we humans participate in such redemption? Rather surprisingly, not only the questions, but also the answers during the era of the witness also took theological form as secular theologies of martyrdom, trauma and or woundedness, recognition and reconciliation proliferated as responses. In what follows, I offer by way of illustration an example from the third chapter of my book, which looks explicitly at witnessing to trauma post Shoah, post Holocaust, and its resemblances to Christian theodicies. Yeah. In 1993, many of you will know this story well, uh, the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Archbishop Michael Pierce, spoke extemporaneously before a gathering of indigenous Anglicans, the National Native Convocation. After several days of hearing testimony about the suffering and the harm inflicted by the church in the residential schools, Piers offered an apology on behalf of the church, which ran over three dozen residential schools in Canada. He said, I also know that I am in need of healing, and my own people are in need of healing, and our church is in need of healing. Without that healing, we will continue the same attitudes that have done such damage in the past. 
I also know that healing takes a long time, both for people and for communities. I also know that it is God who heals and that God can begin to heal when we open ourselves, our wounds, our failures, and our shame to God. I want to take one step along that path here and now." End quote. What is remarkable about this testimony is the shift of focus from the victim's trauma to that of the listener. I am in need of healing, said Piers. My own people are in need of healing. My church is in need of healing. What is the nature of this healing that Piers seeks on behalf of the church, and how might it occur? Piers offers a response. I know that it is God who heals, and that God can begin to heal when we open ourselves, our wounds, our failures, and our shame to God. Emphasis mine. The wounds, the trauma of residential schools are no longer carried by the survivor alone. They're also borne by the listener or the perpetrator's descendants, a descendant whose apology is rendered at least in part to heal his own wounds. The testimony to trauma that is rendered and the healing that is sought are not only for the survival survivor, but also for those receiving the testimony of the survivor. In this case, the representative of a church that caused harm. How did we get here? And what is the significance of the movement outward from the victim to those who did not experience the original event, and even to those who perpetrated it. So the focus of my inquiry is upon the ever-expanding nature or understanding of testimony and how woundedness or trauma constitutes what is increasingly understood to be a shared condition among interlocutors. While a previous generation, um, Shoah survivors, thought about testimony in a much more humble kind of way, for example, Yad Vashem archivist and Shoah survivor, Rachel Auerbach wrote of, quote, the calming and healing influence that testimony would have for survivors. But it was the survivor who was primarily the subject of the story. After the Shoah, one could be a witness even as a perpetrator, where trauma was no longer contingent upon guilt or innocence, but upon having survived an ordeal, including the ordeal that one may have afflicted upon another. The concept of witnessing also expanded to forms of ordeal that also did not necessarily arise from political conflict, but could emerge from the private sphere, such as in the case of sexual violence and abuse. Further, one could also be a wounded witness by listening to, to victims of trauma, as the peer's example testifies to. It is peer's secondary trauma, that is the trauma of the witness to the witness, that is also compelled to his own testimony, which is viewed as a means of healing his own trauma. In this new moment of the era of the witness, which is now intimately tied to personal trauma and its healing, a tacit theological shift takes place in terms of how trauma, healing, and testimony are conceived. Within this shift, witnessing involves bringing to articulously the hidden features of inner experience, including the experiences of guilt and shame, and thus testimony to trauma becomes confessional. It seeks to move beyond guilt and shame to healing. Yet intriguingly, confession itself <clears throat> also moves further and further away from blame. One does not confess to guilt or shame to receive a verdict, but to be absolved of one. That is specifically the verdict of one's own conscience or the misbegotten shame that one experiences. Therapeutic confession seeks to absolve victims of this particular form of suffering under the shadows of guilt and shame, and hence, as Michel Foucault has argued, it has deep affinities with the Christian tradition. Second, testimony to trauma is at once understood as individual and universal. The victim's pain is understood to be inherently individual as it arises from their unique personal affective experiences, which will have to be addressed individually. At the same time, trauma is thought to be universal. That is, anyone who was subject to the same experience would suffer in a like manner. Trauma is also understood to be transmissible, as the experience of woundedness evokes the woundedness of another, as we have seen in the peers' example. Indeed, according to several trauma theorists, it forges a hidden bond across time and space in a time of immense precarity. Third and finally, trauma is seen to be redemptive in these secular accounts. It is from the wounds or the trauma of suffering that we receive 
healing, and strength, giving voice not only promises to deliver the survivor from the experiences of residual suffering from the original event of trauma, but it also promises to do the same for others as it evokes in the listener a sense of their own trauma and the possibility of its overcoming. As trauma theorist Kathy Carruth argues, it represents a life drive in the human subject that can forge a unity among distinct persons and communities through shared mourning. And here Carruth turns Sigmund Freud's death drive on its head. When she talks about the life drive of trauma, Freud of course, of course talked about traumatic repetition as a sort of death drive. She's saying, no, no, life comes out of, out of uh, testimony to, to death and to trauma. So the purpose of my work in this chapter is not to deny the existence of personal trauma, but rather to question why these personal wounds emanating from atrocity are emphasized at this time to such a great extent. In this movement from testimony to trauma, from testimony to the trauma victim, there is also a movement from the juridical and the political to the personal and the therapeutic. Why is it that the articulation of inner affective experience of trauma by a variety of agents, victims, perpetrators, listeners, is seen as the chief modality of coming to terms with the mass suffering in lieu of modalities of political judgment and responsibility? This conception of shared, even universal trauma often overlooks important distinctions for it shifts attention from the casualties of war to personal experiences of violence. It is personal trauma that needs to be addressed and not the politics of mass suffering. In all these three themes, trauma as inner effective experience, trauma as universal, and trauma as redemptive, trauma or the wound operates according to the logic of sin or the wound in Christian theology and practice. Here, testimony viewed largely as confessional exchange of personal experiences of woundedness becomes the governing mod modality for its overcoming, that is, for redemption. The framing of suffering through the lens of woundedness and the prescription that the testimony of trauma of the trauma victim will in itself expiate gift, guilt and deliver healing is a heritable trait from the Christian tradition. And it's one that has a dubious le legacy for it internalizes sin and locates its healing also within the realm of the affective and the symbolic. Church apologies are especially prone to this danger for the churches have long been trained to regard the symbolic and the liturgical as ends in themselves. It is not an acts of reparation toward the neighbor who has been harmed, but rather in the symbolic acts of expiation, particularly those that are accompanied by confession of shame or guilt that come to characterize public apologies as forms of testimony after atrocity. As another genealogist puts it, Michel Foucault writes, because if it is true that the act of confessing is already the beginning of expiation, could we not conclude that in the end, a sufficiently costly and humbling confession is penance in itself, end quote. Almost 30 years after Pierce's speech before the National Native Convocation, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, offered another dramatic apology over the Anglican Church's past as he visited Canada to offer his own apology to survivors of residential schools in 2022. He said, quote, you've opened a window into hell and you've called us to look into hell where you were. This statement to my mind illustrates perfectly the problem of testimony during the current moment of the witness. Welby implies that indigenous suffering is a harrowing scene from the past where you were and that the task of the secondary witness is to look at it with them to share through story the vista of a past nightmare. Now there are many steps that have been made that make this a predictable response on the part of the Archbishop of Canterbury upon hearing the pain of indigenous survivors. These are the steps that I hope to have pointed to in my brief talk today, but Welby's analogy is a faulty one, because in this country, hell is not a vista of past indigenous experience, but in many places an ongoing reality. It is not past, but it is present, and it is not enough to look at hell, to nod and affirm the view, and express shame or guilt over it, 
as though such confession absolves the church. The point is instead to evoke Marx, is to change it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Those are excellent papers. And so we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to move into a little bit of a time of discussion amongst the panelists. And then um, we'll, we'll kind of each, I think, maybe take a chance for each of us to answer, ask a question. And then we'll open it up to the floor. So if you have questions that you've been sitting on, uh, you will get a chance. I wanted to claim um, privilege of the chair to ask you a, a question to begin. Uh, each of you in your excellent papers briefly touches on the role of, of recognition in the structure of how witnessing works. Um, recognition and misrecognition. My question to each of you is how is the figure of the witness affected by the ever th present threat of misrecognition? Or to put it another way, if nobody recognizes a witness, are they really witnessing? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Who would like to begin? <laughs> well, I mean, Go ahead. I, I mean, I think that's why you have the, the genre in the first place, right? The, the desire, um, fraught as it may be, right? How easily it can kind of get um, um, caricaturized in its own way um, to, to, to make recognition claims, right? This is what martyrologies are doing. Um, this is what witness accounts always do. So, I mean, it's easy to see why historically and why we keep doing precisely this thing. Um, it's also easy to see how fragile an art it is. Um, and I guess that's what I find interesting in reading martyrologies because they're so delightfully messy. Um, but that's to kind of take cover in history and dodge the, the weightier question and the more pressing immediate question that Jane is raising. So passing it over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so I think the problem is not just misrecognition, the problem is also recognition, as you know, in the conversations that are happening in Indigenous communities around the pro about recognition as a concept, political recognition, which comes from a, a lineage of, you know, liberal liberalism, essentially, right, which is actually what my next chapter is on, is the problem of recognition. Um, so misrecognition, of course, is a problem when you when you fail to recognize or you rec recognize somebody poorly, particularly the kind of trauma that I'm discussing here. Um, but recognition can also be a problem too, um, because recognition sort of limits the remedies to a very, a very narrow set of uh, uh, political outcomes. There's a wonderful book that I draw on really a, a huge amount in, 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 in my book, which is called um, uh, The Empire of Trauma by Didier Fassin and uh, Richard Rachman. And in it, they talk about these different case studies about, what, about how you have to show that you have a certain amount of trauma in order to be recognized, in order to receive aid. Mm -hmm. And so the case study that they take is, is Palestine and Israel, actually. It's a very timely kind of uh, uh, question. And the Palestinians who are suffering under occupation have to prove their trauma in the terms you know, that I kind of out, laid out here in these very personal terms, in order for them to receive aid from groups like Medicine Sans Frontières, MSF, Doctors Without Borders. And so the problem of recognition is huge, right? Because if you're competing with limited resources for your trauma to be recognized, you know, pretty, pretty quickly you're going to be telling a certain story about what the nature of your suffering is. And you're gonna tell it in this template and not in another. And not every, every culture or every group describes their experience in the same way. So I think it's a great question, thank you. It's really interesting to jump, jump off that into, into questions around disability because that, that's, uh, I guess, the, the problem of, of right recognition of, of disability and 
re receipt of funding yeah. is, is ever present in a dis in disability world. What constitutes disability? What constitutes funding for a disability? Um, it's significant, significant overlap there. But where, where I want to maybe draw my answer back into is kind of the, the place that I um, concluded the paper. Um, the, the, the quote that I drew from, from Adam's dad is that um, witness can, can be ignored and explained away, or it can be received with wonder. And he does set it up in this very kind of dichotomous, well, it's kind of up to the, the recipient in some way. And, and um, the, the, I think in some ways witness, um, and my, my thinking has changed on this a little bit since I, I wrote the, the dissertation first, uh, is, is previously I wanted to locate the idea of witness solely in the witness as a way to kind of honor and, and valorize the task of, of the witness. But, but I think I've, I've pushed away from that a little bit to be that the understanding that, that, that witness only occurs within relationships and witness as a necessarily public task has to be received. And so um, in, in that sense, um, no, if, if no, in, in a sense, if like, I wanna, I wanna push back against, you know, like a, a mere existence as being the grounding of witness and push us into more uh, concept of a, of a particularity and, and those kind of particularities that are only recognized in um, a group where at least two or three are gathered, to use a particularly <laughs> Matean turn of phrase. Can I jump back yeah, in? I mean, I find, maybe to try to give a bit more of a constructive answer, um, the work of the American philosopher Stanley Cavell helpful here, and in particular his account of what he calls disappointing criteria. Um, and there, here he's thinking about criteria for knowledge uh, and, and the so-called threat of skepticism, um, but points out that um, in a sense, the, the problem with the skeptic isn't that he, I mean, is that he wants too much, right? Um, his criteria are such that they can never disappoint and when they do disappoint, um, they become tragically world destroying, right? And, and so everything is lost. And, and this is why he compares um, kind of the, the accounts of, of Cartesian skepticism with Shakespearean tragedy like Othello, right? Um, Othello had, uh, had criteria um, that, you know, for Desdemona's expression of her faithfulness, that were impossibly high and couldn't be met. And I find that um, the discourse of martyrdom is infused with those same dynamics. And, and, and the trick is to, um, to live with criteria that are gonna be disappointing. Um, and that's what I think, that's what I think the history of, of witness kind of grapples with. Yeah. Excellent uh, responses. Now, do you have questions of each other? Um, I want to give it some space for that if you wanted to kind of cross interrogate each other a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if cross interrogate, but I'm trying to get us um, talking across these three very different um, <laughs> reflections. And one thing I notice is that they're all circling sometimes more explicitly, sometimes less explicitly around the category of agency. I think all three of them make a move, something to the effect of emphasizing the agency of God and downplaying um, kind of individual agency. Daniels does it the most, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's my question, right? How do we, how do we, how do we, we I'm a little uncomfortable um, with the strength of your account of 
since nobody has any any agency anyway, right? We can. Um, I mean, that seems like an easy way to open the door. Um, and I want a little bit more human agency um, in in an account of witness. Um, so that's a genuine question to which I don't know the <laughs> answer, and I'm inviting your responses. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I have to think about this for a second. Okay. Do you have something? To... Um, sure. So my book is really about like there's witnesses and there's witnesses and there's mm -hmm. witnessing. And in different political moments, the, these are used in very different ways. Like the witness was used in a very different way in the Eichmann trial than it was in subsequent trauma theory post Shoah, right? And so I'm trying to trace that and look, to look at all the nefarious ways that mm -hmm. it's often used too, that witnessing can be used. Um, so maybe I have a deeper doctrine of sin than all of you or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what I will say is that where I really like witnessing is really just that first generation. And there are other examples as well. It's not just Shoah writers. But if you think about the writing of Primo Levi or even the writing of Night by Elie Wiesel, mm. there's something about that moment of witnessing that doesn't do that abstraction sort of thing, right? That doesn't have this kind of theodicy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that lament that Wiesel does and the secular lament that Primo Levi does in If This is a Man and the Truce is really simply about honoring the dead. Uh -huh. You know, it's not about sort of trying to create a new political configuration that people, you know, can live in. It's not about, you know, having this grand theory about trauma being a, f a, a source of solidarity or new politics. It's really about honoring the dead and remembering the dead. And that lament to me seems to be the most profound form of witness, one that's not given over to a theodicy. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a great interview with Wiesel before he died where he points out that like, um, you'll notice I kept praying the next day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so everybody has run wild with this, this notion of like, oh, we killed God. Yeah. But um, I kept praying. So who was I praying to? Right. It was just, I had to say that. That was right. the thing I had to say right then. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, Primo Levi is writing sort of as a secular uh, Jew. He's a scientist. Um, but still, there's this kind of idea of lament. I see my colleague, Justin Jaron Lewis, here. So I'm wondering if I'm getting anything wrong here, Justin. Mm -hmm. You'll correct me. Um, but there's, um, yeah, there's still this kind of understanding of lament that his primary purpose is to remember in as much detail as he can the logger, right? And to me, that seems like a very different form of witnessing than trying to sort of, you know, justify some sort of state building or something like that, yeah? I've, I've been given more time to think, but I'm not sure if I have yet collected my thoughts. But I will attempt to, I will attempt to speak into your your questions, Chris. Um, I mean, the question of agency and how how agency um, works in in the lives of people with varying level of intellectual disabilities um, is is I think a, a important one and, and a relevant one. And I think it's important for us to recognize that there is not one thing that is intellectual disability, but intellectual disability is a really, 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 really broad term that it, it covers a lot of really, 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 really diverse experiences um, and is, is ultimately something that is primarily negatively defined. And so to speak into the question of agency when we're talking about intellectual disability as we set up that kind of framework is, is um, in some ways to endeavor into a failing task if we set up the question of intellectual disability. Now I use that language in my paper and I use that language in my research because that is in some ways the, the language du jour, who knows what it will be. 10 years from now, but that is what, that is what the language is now. But, but the, the line that I try to walk in the dissertation more so that, that I can do here is, is not that there is no agency, but that the agency is, is measured in maybe, or maybe, maybe in di different categories to, to measure the agency and what's actually at work. I, I wouldn't want to tell the story of Adam 
in the way that I tell it and, and suggest that Adam has no agency in what he is doing. I think that, that um, the stories that, that uh, Adam's dad tells of, of him, the stories that, that you, you encounter when you meet Adam is, is, this, is this is someone who has capacities and desires and um, affections, um, certain sense of, uh, a, an agential um, modes uh, to, to his being. Um, however, um, maybe to ask the question of, of agency is, to re is simply to recognize the limits of our engagement. There's this, there's this really kind of striking debate that happened maybe about 10, five, 10 years ago of, between John Swinton and Hans Reinders, where Hans Reinders gets really famous for writing this book, Receiving the Gift of Friendship. It all centers around this uh, account of uh, a woman named Kelly who's microencephalic, part of her brain is missing. And Reinders speaks into the, the horror that he experiences when he goes and visits, meets Kelly for the first time and sees, sees um, uh, the care workers interacting with her as if she is a human, <laughs> as we would broadly define it. So they seem to be reading things into her. They seem to be thinking that she is happy or thinking that she is finding joy in this, but, but they're clearly reading too much into that story is, is Reinders' conclusion. Swinton comes along as a friend of Hans and says, hold on, buddy, how do you know? We don't know what we don't know. You don't, and so this question of, I guess, the, the inner life of the person who communicates in ways that, is, that are different than the ones that we would be comfortable with. Um, it, it, I, I, my, my conviction is that there's more agency there than we, than we often give credit to. But that, that agency is only something that is, is learned patiently um, through ongoing relationships. So I, I wouldn't I would I wouldn't want to say that there's no agency, but I do recognize I walk that very, very, very thin line. Which Bart makes like really much thinner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. So this is the question, right? Is he helping you on this? Or are you here pushing back on your main theological Resource right. in making some of these latter claims. I mean, I think that as far as like the actual like epistemological claims, that that's that's a fair question, um, and I I am not I'm not sure. I'd have to give I'd have to give that some more thought. But what I do what I do I think maybe more methodologically take from him is the is the kind of dialectical reasoning, the 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 walking the of the narrow ridge, and and if you stray too far to one side, well. Can, can I say why I still really love Bart for purposes like this? I like all of Bart's nines. I don't like his yas so much, but I like his <laughs> nines. And, and, and what he does, he's, and this is why I think Daniel's project is really brilliant, because he refuses to essentialize persons with disabilities, or persons, right? And so he's not going to say, you know, they're going to be some sort of, you know, window or icon to the divine, right? That's not going to happen like, say, a Jean Vanier might. I know we're not supposed to talk about Jean Vanier right now, but uh, uh, certainly his theology is really predicated upon a lot of that romanticization of persons with disabilities. And so I really appreciate the iconoclastic thing that, you know, Bart would do to say, well, th these, these folks are as singular and as other as, as any other um, human creature, right, created by God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, well, um, it's getting on, so maybe we should turn to the audience. We've got two mics. Uh, if you have questions, now would be your chance. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Justin Yarrow Lewis here from the Department of Religion. Thank you for a really interesting panel. So 
Uh, Chris and Jane, your, your talks, the second and third talk, both seem to have a lot to do with stories overshadowing and drowning out other stories. The martyrdom, you know, what actually happened to yeah. the martyrs, like your ancestor being, you know, almost completely overshadowed and reshaped by the earlier legends like Polycarp and, you know, the whole crucifixion of Jesus thing and so on. And Jane, you touched on something very similar with how, you know, practically speaking, in order to get, you know, Médecins Sans Frontières to come and help you out, you have to tell your story in a certain way, right? So, so I'm thinking about that, but my question is actually, uh, Daniel, regarding your talk, because uh, respectfully, listening to what you said, it seemed to me like there was some of that going on. In other words, you told us an anecdote about Adam, who you know is confronted by a yelling man and puts a hand over the man's mouth, and you told the story in such a way that that was an action of great kindness that calmed the man down, which I bought when you were telling it, but thinking about it, maybe you just wanted the man to shut up, and right? And, and then also you were putting this in a framework of Karl Barth and God, you know, invading the world and, and witness being a witness to God coming into the world from completely beyond. And I, I didn't see that in Adam's story at all. I mean, do we know anything about Adam's relationship with God? Or are you saying that he's some kind of image of God? I, I really didn't, didn't get to that story. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you're you know, overlaying it with a lot of other stuff or perhaps not, but I, I want to hear more about it. Yeah, that's a very, very good and very, very fair question because I recognize even though I would consider Adam a friend, I wasn't there when that account happened. Uh, Adam's dad, who tells the story, wasn't there. So I, I guess I am in some sense a, a tertiary witness uh, to the story. Um, I, think, I think that um, I would, I would uh, welcome the accusation that I'm, that I'm doing something similar to the, the martyrological traditions. I would wonder whether it's possible to do anything different. Um, and in, in the nature of, of what I was trying to push us towards in the account of particularity, um, in, the, in the account of um, having to, to um, learn, um, I guess, relationships with individuals um, in, in some ways, um, I think, we we are all we are all reliant on the depth of the relations that we have with one another, um, and I think that um, even though Adam can't, you can't interrogate him after the fact, and because he doesn't speak using words, I think he communicates in some ways, but he, you can't sit him down and be like, okay, Adam, tell me. What were you doing there? Did God lead you to do that? Um, it's impossible. Um, and so in, in some ways, um, the, I guess the, the, the danger here, which is a danger that I'm, that I'm very aware of, is, is it could be read as just an instrumentalizing account. Here's somebody who can't speak for themselves, and so now you are going to put words in their mouth. I hope that I'm not doing that. Um, I hope that the, the, the testimony of those who spent much more time with Adam than I have, who recognize his behaviors, who see him in much, uh, much uh, different contexts as well, and it, everything from um, in church cathedrals to waking up in the middle of the night, night after night, to um, the different kinds of day and support programs that he finds part. I hope that there would be something truthful in their witness um, that um, that is reliable. And, and I, would, I, I hope that 
the kind of theological framework or, or apparatus that I'm reading into this story is, is also faithful to the way that, that they've passed that story on to me. So I think that, that you're absolutely right uh, in, in raising that as like the, that's, that's the issue really. And, um, and I think that in my previous response, I, I, I suggested that, that it is a bit of a take it or leave it. Um, and, um, I guess my, the only, the only, um, I don't even know what, the, the only, I guess, caution I would push against leaving it is, well, if we leave it, what might, what might we miss? And, and so um, maybe that's not satisfactory at all. And, and to many it won't be, but that's kind of where I'm at with a story like that. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, all three of you. I want to pick up, in a sense, from where you left off, maybe not quite as eloquently, uh, but if I understood all three of you correctly, one of the things you're trying to really share with us and tear, tease apart and open up is the very fact that the, the whole sense of the martyr's story is created. It's interpreted from an event that's happened. And so it seems to me, just as we've seen play out here beautifully, there are going to be people for whom it's very powerful and they attribute all kinds of agency and things. And there will be others who maybe not quite so sure, you know, that that really connotes what you're, you're claiming it does. But it seems to me that that's one of the most enlightening things for me tonight is, is really all three of you opening that up. And I, I did want to kind of throw something toward uh, uh, Dr. Hubner, if I could. Did I see your name correctly? Hubner, Hubner. Okay. We'll with that. Um, though you never use the term figural interpretation, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if that's, if you sort of agree, that that's really what's at work with a lot of these previous martyrdom stories that we build the image and we take a, an incident from this and a characteristic from that and it was like this patriarch and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, that's sort of classic figural interpretation, yeah. both of scripture and of the Christian tradition. And I, I just wanted to get your comment on that, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's right. Um, I'd only add that, here's the tricky move if you, I mean, if, if you, if you kind of go with the Boyarin and Ellis Daly quotes on the first slide, right? Not, not an event, but a discourse that a, a factual discourse is every bit as much of a discourse as a figural one, right? Um, and, and one of the interesting things I think you start to see in the Middle Ages is kind of the confluence of those two approaches uh, at the same time. I find that really interesting. Um, but it's just, it's just the way stories work, Thank you, all three, for your for your papers. Uh, I think my papers for my question question is for Dr. Barter. Uh, I, we we find ourselves uh, the the land acknowledgement is is pretty well ubiquitous now. You, yeah. even, you go to a, even a bombers game, they'll they'll give a a land acknowledgement beforehand. Uh, your your description of how witness functions in our trauma inflected day is, has sort of helped me maybe to put a, a finger on some of the discomfort yeah. I've had about the land acknowledgement. Uh, and what type of work is the land acknowledgement doing? Does it become an exercise in sort of looking into the darkness and finding and pardoning ourselves through, through doing that? Right. I think that's a great example of just sort of that symbolic affective thing that we do uh, so that we don't have to do any of the material reparations. And there's a wonderful book by an indigenous scholar, an Athabascan scholar by the name of Diane Million. She wrote a book titled Therapeutic Nations. And she looks at how indigenous trauma is utilized, including in the residential schools and missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, and how it's utilized by settler colonial culture in order to say like, these are the kinds of indigenous traumas that have to be addressed. And we're going to address them sort of on this personal individual level. And we're gonna forget all about all of that material <coughs> economic stuff, right? 
Um, and she reads the TRC actually that way. I mean, I know lots of good things happen in the TRC, but she's very, very critical of the TRC insofar as it became this public spectacle where we're witnessing to indigenous trauma. So that makes us better people as settlers. Yeah, thanks for that question. I feel like I got to lean down here a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's not imposing at all. <laughs> it feels awkward, but I'll try my best. Um, so I think my question is mostly for Jane. It's kind of kind of piggybacking off uh, what was just mentioned here a second ago. And um, so I think most of us probably have some feeling of the sort of cynicism of of uh, sort of you know the kind of public performance of uh, some of these things that you're you're both invoking right now, and um, I think it's kind of understandable in some ways that you get reactions uh, coming from you know kind of re you know a reactionary thing where there's a feeling of like there's just this kind of blanket guilt you know a blanket kind of and there's no identification of particular you know, uh, agents uh, who, are, who are actually guilty. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, I won't go into that right now. I just feel like there's a, there's a, there's a kind of blanketing of guilt that gets spread yeah. around too, too loosely. Um, but uh, stepping back from that for a second, you, you invoked Marx. And um, I, I think this is a problem within Marxism itself, like where uh, the question, often is um, like, how does, how does change happen, right? Uh, is it just structural? Is this something like the revolution will just happen because you know capitalism has these contradictions and, and, and so therefore the end of it will just happen? Or is it a matter of a change of heart has to happen somehow, right? And are we in a kind of bind yeah. where yeah. Um, on the one hand, you know, I'm thinking of, say, there was a Canadian Marxist, uh, uh, G.A. Cohen, uh, who, um, who, you know, later in life kind of came around to what he saw. He was a Jewish uh, scholar uh, at Oxford. And he yeah. um, came around to something like the Christian position, which was that there had to be some kind of change of heart right, that would right. take place before there would ever be any kind of revolutionary yeah possibility. Um, and so I just, I, 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 like, I feel all the misgivings that you right, feel about, right. about the, the kind of performativeness of yeah. some of these cynical things. But on the other hand, how does the change of heart, I mean, or is there an, is that necessary even, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I think, I think there's a, there's a problem right, right. <laughs> uh, there, but anyways, I, I'm just yeah, throwing that no, at you. That's, I don't know that's how to. Just a, such a great question. Um, I won't be able to address it fully. Um, I do think Yes, there has to be a change of heart. It's almost impossible to change hearts and minds given how ubiquitous um, and formidable um, capital, contemporary capitalism is, you know, and, and the way in which it inflects ourselves, itself into every possible domain of our lives, including, you know, our private lives, including our religious lives and so on. Um, but the heroes that I look to in the book are people who are at once able to look at those sort of personal effective psychotherapeutic things and also look at the structural things together. So there's some good examples like Walter Benjamin, for example, who is a Marxist, right, who does have a structural analysis, but is also probing the effective, is probing, you know, the beautiful and the ways in which one is compelled by a vision of, of beauty, of the transcendent, right? Um, another good example might be Frantz Fanon, for example, who it takes very seriously this idea of, of perpetrator guilt, believe it or not, right, as a psychoanalyst. Analyst. And, and he's cognizant of the way in which, yes, like those of us who are perpetrators in this society actually have this burden of shame upon us, which is debilitating. But you can't address that without looking at the structural questions. And I, and I would say for Marx too, like when you read Capital, yes, it's a social scientific book, but it's also something that's like deeply invested in questions of, 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 of the heart, of, of, you know, of actually emancipating people so that their hearts are set free. You know, that's the goal. It's not just to transform society. So thank you. Can I jump in here? Yeah, please. Um, on, like right at, on that point, right at the end, I mean, I, it, it, so um, you take a shot at uh, well-being. Um, but, but the way you summarize it, it's like, 
it's not enough to look. Yeah. Right. You have to yeah. act. Right. Um, but I wonder if that gets. I wonder if that's the distinction that you really want. Um, I mean, it seems to me that you have to look. The question is whether you see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and you only get action when you really see. Right. And I, I wouldn't want to say that Marx is doing just acting. I mean, the whole point that makes Marx Marx is he claims to see something. Right. He's right. not just yeah, looking. Yeah. Right. He's not just doing a spectator looking. Yeah. Um, but an attentive. So the vice of Welby isn't that he's looking. It's that he's no, we're looking together. That's the problem. Well, but he's like upon he's completely a, upon, inattentive. Upon a past tragedy. Right. Right. Yeah. But he's not really looking. Yeah. The point is that he's not not that he's looking. That he's not really looking. He's not right. seeing anything. Right. He's he Does has he doesn't Does have that... a history of looking. And you know, last week I did this talk at St. Paul's College, and it was a great time. And and I hate to confess this as an Anglican priest, you know, among so many Anglicans, but. To me, the papal apology was really something that was beautiful. Yes, it was effective and symbolic and so on, but what made it beautiful to me was the fact that Francis has been speaking for over a decade about the global proletariat, right? And about climate disaster, climate catastrophe. And so he has, and decolonization. So in that context, he could say something that's really symbolic and effective, and I won't get so cynical about it because he's really put his money where his mouth is. That's a bad metaphor, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe not the right metaphor. Right. <laughs> All right. I think this will have to be our last question, but we'll, we'll give it to John. Uh, the, the name is John Bupan, Canadian Mennonite University. Uh, one thing that occurred to me as a commonality between the three of you, maybe it's just my, my the lens which I bring to everything, which is body, so just so you know. <laughs> uh, in Adam's story, uh, the centrality of the body, in the, in the martyrdom of the martyrs, there are all these bodies, right? Or let's say the Eichmann's trial, the witnesses, their bodies are there offering their testimonies. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts might be if we were to locate the agency in the body rather than, I don't know, like, you know, sometimes I wonder if agency is too much located with the word like witness in this kind of volitional, rational, yeah. uh, verbal kind of way. What might it mean to locate, the lo locate agency in the body? And maybe the, the thing that I'll say as, as a Christian I bring to that question is I see the body as kind of very much being a sacred space, right? Uh, an enfleshment of the sacred. So what might it look like to locate agency in the body rather than mm. something else? Yeah, can I start? Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you for that question. I mean, I came um, of age as a theologian. I started studying theologi theology um, when feminism, feminist theology was really talking about the body a lot. And, and I, was, I was very, very critical of it, and I, I still remain really critical of it, because I think that the body, in spite of all of its self-evidence, is really something that is deeply discursive in the sense that bodies are always going to be mediated in a certain kind of way. We can talk about bodies in this way, but we're always going to be kind of making that abstraction, if you know what I mean. And so one of my problems with the appeal to the body, which is kind of ubiquitous in a certain generation of feminist thought, is that it really isn't situated enough in terms of those kinds of critical structural things which shape women's bodies. So yes, we can talk about the body in sort of like second wave spaces, but that looks very different from say, like an indigenous woman's body, you know, a missing and murdered indigenous women girl. So that essentializing move is something that I get worried about when we talk about the body, I'm sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to avoid reified bodies? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that you are very right to identify what what's a lot of what's going on here in this kind of pushback against this like oh, overly like rationalized like I think I think of like in the in the context the evangelical context that I grew up in like to witness was to like share Romans road or like you know the 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 rational argument of why God exists or something and and uh, what I what when I discovered Bart I felt uh, liberated from those shackles and so I, I do think that I'm that I'm uh, that 
you've picked up rightly that I'm trying I'm trying to push back against that big or significantly and create something much different where where I think that the the place of the body is is um, accurate is in on the, the 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 examples that I noted from from the prophets um, especially the examples of of Isaiah and Ezekiel um, walking around naked for a few years lying on one side before flipping over and just searing the other side just make sure you're well done um, <laughs> Though those are those are bodily acts, um, I, w I I would be um, I, so I think I think the body would be a better place than than the rational. But I would I would, I would raise similar concerns as as uh, Jane has um, about about uh, a worry about essentializing that because I think the the when you're working in disability spaces. And the, the move that I that I also tried to push back against here is um, uh, um, all but all of these bodies are like that, and I don't think that that's necessarily what you're suggesting here. But but it would be where I where I would wonder if maybe a, a better space is a, a relationality. Of course, relationality is lived in bodies and and uh, uh, discoursed amidst bodies. Um, uh, but it would be something I'd have to I'd have to think more. But I, I would I would I think generally would just be overly concerned about essentializing any form of what's well, it's not this. Therefore, it has to be this. I think there might be room for play around a few different loci. Maybe I'll just end by making a plea for the rational. Um, <laughs> no, I, because I I push back at your. Witness is too rational, it's not embodied enough. Um, I think rationality is embodied work. Reason um, isn't disembodied. So I'm more inclined to go with Spinoza and be a monist uh, and think of mind and body uh, as not two different things, right? Um, but, but two sides of the same coin. And, and the problem comes when you kind of go the dualist route, but then I don't, like, what's the body over against? Um, so to make the body over against something is to already have kind of embraced a uh, problematic dualistic perspective that I don't think, I don't think you want to embrace either, <laughs> um, but I certainly don't, right? But that gives, that lets reason and, and the mind come back in, right? Um, in some interesting ways. And so I think the problem is more, um, so, um, let's talk about Spinoza again just for a minute, right? I mean, Spinoza is known for his claims about imminence, and we think, oh, he abandons um, transcendence. He doesn't abandon transcendence at all. He abandons um, external causation, right? This idea that God is an external cause who relates to us the way I just did with Daniel, <laughs> right? Um, that's not how God um, relates to us, right? An imminent cause is, is a cause that's, uh, in a sense, on the inside, and uh, they, you can't get that if you go with Descartes, right? Um, you're committed to a kind of world of mechanistic causation, right? You've got objects bumping up against other objects, and everything becomes force and counterforce. And um, so I think, I think it's not the question of are we for or against the body, but what is the body over against um, when we make it over against something? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, give, give these panelists another round of applause. <laughs> All right, I'm sure some of you still have lots of things you want to talk about. And so we have wine and some refreshments out in the Galleria. Uh, please stick around for that. And um, if you enjoyed this event this evening, we will be having another one next October. So um, keep your eyes peeled for your announcements around that. Uh, this is gonna be hopefully a, an annual thing going forward. And uh, there's many more things to come around theology at St. John's hopefully um, in the near future. So uh, thank you all for coming out. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.